Welcome to Parlapod, the world's only Swamp Thing podcast. And yes, you heard me right. We're the only show online dedicated to the muck-encrusted mockery of a man. And we have a treat for our listeners this episode, as acclaimed and award-winning horror novelist Nancy Collins calls in to talk about the secrets of her Swamp Thing run and much, much more. So sit back, relax, and let's go into the green. This is Parlapod. New from Parlico. Hey kids, do you want the hottest new toy of the season? <laughs> Introducing the Thunder Pedal Parlapet. Get ready to be amazed. amazed. You want a pal? Just add water. <laughs> In a matter of minutes, Thunder Pedal is ready to play. La 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 la. He sings. He dances. He dominates your yard. La 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 la. La? You'll be the envy of every kid in the neighborhood, provided there's one left when Thunder Pedal is through. La 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 la. <laughs> Thunder Pedal from Parlico. Bloom into doom. Tefe not included. All right, welcome to Parlapod. I'm one of your hosts, David Schultz. I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, John Benedict. And today we have the privilege of speaking to acclaimed author, Nancy Collins, whose Swamp Thing run in the early 90s, in my humble opinion, is nothing short of legendary. So, Nancy, thank you for being with us today. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. I'm glad you're interested in talking to me. Oh, we're honored. We're honored to have you on. And Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic you found the time to speak with us today. And before we get started on the Swamp Thing stuff, I was actually a little curious about some of your inspirations or your early life as far as how did you first get into writing? What was the driving force behind that? Well, it's always it's always been uh, an element of my personality. Being a writer, I was just basically, you know, if you ask anyone in my family who's still alive, who can remember <laughs> when I was a child, um, they'll tell you that I was born to be a writer. That I was always writing. I, 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 I was writing story, quote unquote, stories uh, before I learned to read and write. Wow. Uh, I, I would, I would kind of draw these crude little illustrations, uh, and then stand next to the person who I was showing it to and explain to them what what the story was. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, I instead, but instead of growing up to be a cartoonist, I I became a writer because I I just really didn't have the the um, hand eye coordination to be uh, a decent artist. Although I I gave I gave it something of a try back when I was growing up taking taking art classes and stuff like that. I just right. did not have the skill or or the patience to to go through that. That is something I can definitely relate to, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> But, but I discovered I could create what I saw in my head through words much faster uh, with far more ability than I could with my with my hands. Right. So did you ever, when you were a kid and you were telling these stories, you knew from the, the outset, someday I want to create some, some form of storytelling. Uh, you never had any aspirations to do anything different, or did you always want to be a writer? I was I always wanted to be a writer, although I went to school for radio television because... Oh, wow. Because I wanted you know, the the other thing that was a, a big motivating factor in my uh, it's been writing or music and and that's something else I have absolutely no no skill at oh. <laughs> no no innate ability right uh, to I, I tried you know I tried you know I might have been a drummer if, if they had allowed me to be a drummer because we were trying to join the the uh, junior high school band they were real weird about girls being drummers. They already had one girl who was a drummer. For the aspiring uh, authors out there, about how long did it take you from the time you, you got serious about writing and wanted to get published that you actually got your, your first piece published? About how long did that process take? Well, I first, I, I started trying to get serious about it around the age of 19 when I was in college. I, I, I think I sent something to Asimov's and it got rejected, although I got a really nice rejection letter. So I kind of did a lot of my work in my chops in, in fanzines back then. I had a semi-professional sale. Let's see. My first semi-professional, which was to the horror 
show magazine was uh, back in 1982, 83. And then I didn't sell anything again. And, and, and the second sale was Semi Pro and into again the horror show magazine <laughs> until uh, eighty eight or eighty nine, and by that time I'd sold my first novel. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> but but I was at the same time. But during all this, I was also work, doing the Semi Pro thing. I was writing reviews and and critiques and essays and articles for Amazing Heroes and a couple of other magazines that were nonfiction based. It was just not fiction. So it, so I was I was learning learning my deadline chops and and other things like that at this time, while working various menial jobs, you know the usual minimum wage jobs here and there, and uh, and so I, first, I sold my first novel. I made my first legitimate sale at the age of 28. You know, I sold my first novel at 28, 29. So about, it took about 10 years. Some of us have a lot of catching up to do. <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty good timeline, I think. Now, you know, you're known for being also a horror author. What was the appeal of the genre of horror for you? Was it something you were always kind of interested in? Or was it more of um, you tried kind of writing different type stuff and just didn't stick? I've always had an interest in horror. But at, when I was growing up, there really wasn't that big a distinction in the genres between horror, fantasy, and, and science fiction. It was all it was all science fiction, fantasy, and horror were all kind of in the same barrel, and, and horror itself was viewed as you know, not necessarily a, sub, a, a distinct subgenre from or a distinct genre from fantasy. They were all or science fiction for that matter. They were all kind of lumped together in the same in the same um, same ghetto. My grandfather was a um, very very big Boris Karloff, Bela Lugosi fan. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I was exposed to, you know, like the classic universal horror movies very early in life. And also in the early 60s, that was the time of the, you know, the, one of the major, you know, monster, monster mania times, you know, right. like all the horror, horror movie hosts and all the monster, mo- you know, uh, model kits from Aurora and, and the Adams family and the monsters on television. It was just, it, it yeah, it was it was a big time to be a monster kid, right. and so that that wasn't that big a deal, and right. and it was all part you know it, it kind of bled into other aspects of the culture like the you know kind of like Big Daddy Off rat sinks and all that. So uh, it was just all part of the early '60s, you know, just all right. So you started off as a fan, most notably thanks to your grandpa. Yeah, yeah, my family. Uh, did not discourage flights of fancy. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, my my grand my mom used to read comic books. I mean, she used to read Captain America and Captain Marvel and all that. You know, you know, it's, it's, her attitude was, uh, I don't care what they're reading as long as they're reading. Right, uh, that's because, a good thing to encourage. You know, yeah, illiteracy was was, was and still is a, a big plague in 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 the rural South. Well, and I think that's that's something a lot of people. Um, you know, especially in my house too. You know, uh, that's the thing with a lot of kids. The uh, comics is is actually something that gets a lot of kids into reading. You know, because it's a it's a good escape. It's it's interesting. They they actually get their their reading equivalency and their reading level up so that they can go on and and read those textbooks and stuff in school because you know a lot of that stuff is so boring to a child that, uh, you know, comics actually gets their foot in the door wanting to read more stories and novels and all that good stuff. So I think that for me. comics is actually a great way for, for kids to get into reading. Yeah, you know, the same grandfather who was a big uh, Boris Karloff fan was also a huge Edgar Rice Burroughs fan. And he had, all like, all the original Argosies and stuff like that. That first had the, all the Burroughs serialized novels, uh, and he was a banker. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> his, his his mother was a was a teacher, and he was a banker. But that was his that was his passion was uh, reading Edgar Rice Burroughs. You know, there wasn't a a big distinction. Oh, you're rotting your brain or anything like that was in my family. And I I think I I think I learned to read by the time I was five. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I already knew. I know already knew how to read by the time I went to kindergarten. You know, Doctor Seuss obviously was a big influence, and after that, um, stuff like um, you know, there a lot of a lot of picture books that, that kind of you know that are considered you know Newbery Medal Award winners at, at the time, and 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 my early the first books for young adults that I can remember reading, or juveniles, whatever they called them back then, were like Charlotte's Web. Right. Stuart Little, uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, A Wrinkle in Time. Those were all like you know, huge favorites, and I read those over and over and over again growing up. Now, now I have to ask, one fan to another, I also love Charlotte's Web. Did you cry at the end? Because I bawled like a baby. <laughs> oh, yeah. Everyone, everyone cries at the end of Charlotte's Web, whether they admit it or not. I admit it, and, you know, God love her. That's, that's one of the things I love about my wife is we uh, – generally get emotional at the end of uh, Charlotte Webb, be it the book, be it the cartoon, whatever. We we just ball like little kids <laughs> even today. Yeah, I still and and when I find spiders in my house, even though you know, sometimes sometimes I have to kill them because they're way too big, but <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> or or might or might be might be poisonous. Yeah, you know, I usually try to usher them outside, and, and I call them Charlotte. So, oh. you know, come on, Charlotte, let's get you outside. You know, you can't live here. Yeah. Be sweet <laughs> I don't you. care where you go, but you can't stay here. <laughs> <laughs> that had a major, major impact on me growing up. Um, influenced my my tastes and my and my interests later on in life. I had a lot of older cousins, and I inherited a lot of their comic books. And, and I think that one of the, the one of the, the saddest things that's happened is that, that how comics moved away from younger readers. Right. Because it's kind of like the Catholic Church. If they're not reading comic books by the time they're five, you're, you're, you're not going to have them when they're 35. And when I was growing up, there was all kinds of stuff that was aimed particularly at younger readers, um, like Sugar and Spike, uh, Herbie, the original uh, Carl Barks, uh, Donald Ducks, and Uncle Scrooges, some of which is is timeless. You know, Little Lulu, Richie Rich, you know that that stuff was kind of like um, training wheels, right? For um, uh, going into the to the more uh, I don't want to say adult comics because they really weren't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, not at the time, but the, right? The, the, the more mainstream comics, uh, eventually leading into like you know reading you know like Marvel comics I ever read was. Um, Fantastic Four, like a Kirby Fantastic Four from like 64, 65, Spider-Man, Superman, you know, all, all, all that, of course, the, also being exposed to you know, like the gold key and, Car- and Carlton characters, which, yep, which right. the reason you got exposed to them is because your grandparents, bless their hearts, go, well, they like comic books. And then they go. And, they we'll go get them some Donald Duck. Anyway, yeah, well, they well, Donald Duck would have been fine, but no, they the uh, uh, Carlton and Gold Key, especially Gold Key, used to sell ten of their comics for a dollar in a bag, right. in a plastic bag. You would go into like the the drug store, and this was back. You didn't have to go into a comic book store. All you do is walk into a, a, a drug store or a grocery store or a, a stationery store or the pool hall or the bus station. You know they're Wherever there was a newsstand, oh, they'd get, you, you know, there'd be comics, and and uh, they'd go in and and they'd be and they'd have a ten, you know, ten for a dollar, and it's and it's all stuff that you would, you know, the kid wouldn't normally buy you know, on a on a dare. Right. <laughs> and, right. And, and they're not they're the the ones that are aimed at. Oh, yeah, get get your grandparents to buy it because they don't know any better. Yeah. And, <laughs> and um, yeah, you know, or it, you, you get those when you're on your birthday or when you were sick. Yeah, <laughs> so right. That's how I, so that's how um, I ended up getting exposed to stuff like you know Magnus Robot, you know Fighter, and you know Turok Son of Stone, and you know, a lot of the Carlton and, and Gold Key uh, characters. Now, though, uh, to ask you more about the comics, you, you said you know you had an early love of them, and um, your family encouraged you reading any form of material as long as you're reading. Um, when you, when you were writing, you, you were an author, you're writing horror. Um, did you ever think about writing comics? I mean, was there ever something? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I wanted to write. In fact, my first novel, uh, Sunglasses After Dark originally started life as a comic book script, uh, or, or, or as an intended comic book series. It was, um, I had a friend, uh, when I was living in New Orleans, this was back in the mid 
eighties and a friend named Richard Only who was working for a comic book store at the time, a gold mine. And uh he had some, you know, this was at the time of the black and white comic independent comic booms. They said, Well you could draw and I can write. Let's try and make a comic book and it wasn't called Sunglasses After Dark. Uh I can't remember what originally we were calling it. But he was gonna draw it and I was gonna write it. And I was I was very busily writing it. And by the time I had finished the first issue, he had gotten a job right, working for Howard Chaikin on American Flag. Oh, awesome. <laughs> and then moved okay. off to, the, to, Calif- to California. And I, and I went, well, damn it. Oh, <laughs> so I've, got this, I've got this script. What do I do with it? So I, uh, and at that time, I was corresponding with John Shirley. Uh, who was like one of the founding fathers of cyberpunk. He was more or less mentoring me uh, and teaching me to write through mail. I would, se- I would send him things, and he would edit them and <laughs> send them back to do it right this time. And <laughs> so I sent him this, this script, and he said, you know, this, some, there's, this, this would make a good novel. Mm-hmm. You just have to write it so that it's, you know, like a novel. Right. And I, and I had written short stories with the same character, Sonya Blue, since, since high school. Mm-hmm. I just I had this I had created this character, you know, years before, and was just trying to figure out some way of telling the story. And so I I said okay, well, and I started working on it, uh, and it eventually became Sunglasses After Dark, which came was published in 1989 and won the won the Horror Writers Association Bram Stoker Award for Best First Novel, and it won the uh, British Fantasy Award for Best First Novel, and was nominated for the James Tiptree Award and the John W. Campbell Award twice, also nominated for, uh, I think, the Theodore Sturgeon Award. Wow. Something, uh, Nancy, that I have noticed, especially going back and rereading your run uh, from start to the finish, I noticed back in the 80s to even really the early 90s, you got a lot more bang for your buck when you, when you bought a comic. Mm-hmm. Like a single issue had so much story in one single issue, whereas today you'll pick up a, a comic, and by the time you look at splash pages and ads and everything in it, you really only have about six, maybe seven pages of readable story. Um, has somebody in the in the industry? Um, I'm, I'm sure you've noticed this change as, as well. Like, when did you start uh, noticing, I guess, a change in the uh, story format of, of the books that, that were hitting shelves? When I first started writing comics, you had to have at least 26 pages of script. 26, 26 to, you know, it was a 38-page comic, and anywhere from 26 to 32 pages of script. At the very least, 26. And I will admit that my scripts are probably not the best to go by because I was learning how to write comics at the time. I tended to make them six panels to a page. Someone said, yeah, I mean, it has to be, you know, you kind of do it like this. And and you have to have at least one splash or one two-page. I, 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 I wasn't that good at, at, at incorporating two-page splashes until I got far later into what I was doing. But look at how much uh, character development, though, that you got in those stories. I mean, like, it was like reading, like, just not necessarily like a lifetime of these characters, but it's like you really felt that you knew these characters because there was so much character development uh, within even a single issue. Well, that, that has a lot to do with the individual writer, and and, and I brought... Basically, in my case, I was bringing, you know, my background as a prose writer into that. There's a lot of people who go in comics nowadays who've never, ever written prose. They've just written comic book scripts. They're, they, they're more along the lines of television writers than prose writers. And I think that is the essential difference between the two. It has one, A, it has a lot to do with the individual's, you know, ability and, and, you know, or talent or whatever you want to call it, and be their what they're what they draw from, whether they're drawing from you know t- pure visual storytelling, or if their background is also into more the more in depth prose style. And mine was very much prose style. Sometimes I go back and look at it and think, man, those balloons are way too heavy. 
<laughs> yeah, great. I should have broken those balloons up better <laughs> because there's a lot of information squeezed in there. <laughs> and, and, and about Sunglasses After Dark, it did eventually become a comic book. Oh, it was an excellent comic, as a matter of fact. But as far as Swamp Thing, how did the whole gig come about? How did the DC approach you? Um, did you show interest in writing comics to them? Did you s- submit any material to them? Or? How I got that gig is is, is interesting, and and it has everything to do with Freddy Krueger. Okay. And, <laughs> um, it all comes back to Freddy. <laughs> yeah, it all comes back to Freddy. I was doing a lot of short story uh, work back then, back, um, back when you could write for a bunch of anthologies and, and actually make a living at it. That's another thing that's changed since since then. I was approached by, um, I'm blanking on his name now, uh, but he was a uh, uh, head of Head of merchandising and, and licensing uh, at New uh, at New Line, but uh, he liked Sunglasses After Dark, and he was in charge of getting some of the Freddy Krueger stuff licensed uh, into you know doing prose novels because the Freddy Krueger TV show was still on at that point, and they were getting ready to do some more stuff with you know like towards the end of the the Nightmare on Elm Street uh, cycle. Okay. And there was this, uh, this is original, all original novelettes and novellas, um, written by leading horror writers at the time called, um, what was it, uh, Freddy's Sweetest Dreams. And he wanted me to write a Freddy Krueger story. So basically, I ended up writing a Freddy Krueger story where Freddy Krueger really doesn't, in, is fairly involved. But, <laughs> but it, it, but it was really dark and it was pretty much a crime noir. Okay. Kind of a sins of the father upon the son kind of thing. That's the son of a serial killer growing up to become one. I, I believe the story's called Not Just a Job, about a, a tow truck driver who's actually a, a, a serial killer. He's fighting the um, desire to become a serial killer like his father, but, you know, and, the, and what's pro- prodding him towards realizing his his inner demon is, is Freddy Krueger. The editor on this book was Stuart Moore. And and Stuart just they just spies working on this book. <laughs> and it's not because of the writers so much as because of the constant interference by uh, New Line, which but okay. no, we we don't want this. And that's the biggest problem sometimes with doing licensed characters you know, is that sometimes you get a lot of a lot of notes from the, the from the Hollywood people because that's what they're used to. And in my case, he was at, he had he enjoyed working with me because I got no notes. <laughs> <laughs> and he enjoyed working with me. He liked my story. Enjoyed I you know, he and I talked on the phone a few times. And, and uh, he was working at St. Martin's Press at the time. And we and when we got along just fine. And then he ended up coming on at DC. And at this time, uh, it was at the end of the Doug Wheeler run on yeah. Swamp Thing. And they were looking for someone to try and build the character back up. That that run wasn't so hot, from what I hear. It had dropped below. Uh, it whenever monthly sales dropped below forty thousand. Now they would dance rings around you in delight if your monthly sales huh. were forty thousand. Right. But at the time, if they dropped below forty thousand, you were on the bubble. You were put, you know, on the chopping block. And if it dropped below thirty, you, you got the act. And the only reason that Swamp Thing did not get canceled at this point was because of the TV show. USA Network, absolutely. Yeah, that was the only reason. And I, and I believe they had a toy line that was coming out, maybe the cartoon show as well. Yep. I, see, I never, I did not have cable at this time. I only had, like, broadcast television. I was living in New Orleans and didn't have cable. So I was not aware that any of these things existed <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> at the time. <laughs> So that's where a lot of your uh, your Cajun influence comes from into your run on the book because that's where you were at at the oh, time. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm the only person who's ever worked on that book who actually lived there. Right. I, I've been there several times myself, and and just several things from your run is just so dead on, and it's probably because you were looking out your window and was was seeing it going on. You know. Oh yeah, yeah. I I, I mean yeah. I lived in New Orleans for ten years. I'm from Southeast Arkansas, which is Bayou Country. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I, I grew up uh, within flooding distance of the Mississippi. 
snapping turtles, alligators, water moccasins. Those are all part of my childhood. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, the the street musicians, you know, that that's something that, uh, you know, I have fond memories, which, uh, you know, of course, I've, I've not been in the last several years. But when I used to go to visit, that was uh, something that uh, I always used to enjoy was watching the uh, street musicians. And uh, when we got to in your run that uh, it might have been the second or third issue into your run, it had uh, I believe his name was Yaya. Yeah, the, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Zydeco player. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, I mean, man, that that took me right back. And then him telling the ghost stories and, and playing the music and all that. I mean, it, it was literally like I was I was there. Yeah, there's a, there's an interesting interesting backstory on all all that. I mean, basically going back and flipping through these um, issues of maybe remember how just every issue is just crammed full of information and inside jokes, stuff that you know the only person who's ever going to be able to tell you about is me, oh. apparently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, or some of it was just just. Inside jokes between me and a couple of people, or people I knew, or, or or people who have a background in history and whatever. But Yaya is actually uh, based on, and his origin, sadly enough, is actually based on an, a real person, a real musician named Amade Adon, who was the first Black Zydeco uh, recording musician. Oh wow! He basically is credited with uh, laying the groundwork for Cajun music in the early 20th century. And he died exactly as portrayed in the comic. Wow! Wow! That is so sad. Yeah. Yeah. He was. Yeah. yeah. He was beat. He was beaten to death for wiping his face with a white woman's handkerchief. Oh man! Wow. But well, actually, he didn't. He didn't die of that. But he was beaten into idiocy. They ran. They backed the car up over him and crushed his head and throat. Yeah, and the story. Yeah, they crushed his larynx with the truck. So he was basically re- reduced to a vegetable after that. Oh my God. Well, in all those stories, he he was telling um, Swamp Thing and and Abby in the swamp. Were were those stories based on genuine folklore? Oh yeah, those are actual real stories from uh, a book by Roger Talent, who is a, uh, a Creole uh, folklorist. He, he wrote a couple books. The uh, one of which is called Gumbo Yaya, which is kind of where Yaya gets his name. Right. Yeah, Robert Talent. He also wrote a book about Marie Laveau called Voodoo in New Orleans. And one called the Voodoo Queen. He also wrote one about uh, Jean Lafitte. Mm-hmm. But uh, these were all written in the 30s and 40s. But uh, what was it? The American Horror Story uh, witches thing about the uh, woman who was torturing mm-hmm. the her her, uh, her slaves. That's that's mm-hmm. a, that's a story that's from Gumbo Yaya. It's a real, and it's a true story. Let me uh, let me ask you this, Nancy. That story with Yaya in, in uh, all of his folk tales that actually sets up the the next what I would consider a uh, big part of of mm-hmm. the arc uh, with the uh, with the pirates. Yeah, uh, dark. Dark Conrad. Dark, Dark Conrad Constantine, because he was a, you know, a, a relative, a distant relative yeah, of Constantine. A pirate. Yeah, who, who bears an uncomfortable resemblance to a certain pirate from a certain Disney series. Yeah, this well, John's going to get into it, that. It, <laughs> this is what I was going to bring up. <laughs> David and I talked about this last night. So so this is this is my thing. I contacted, I contacted DC and said, you may want to talk to Disney about that. Pirates of the Caribbean. Well, absolutely. Like I'll be the first to say it. They they stole it. They, they stole it. Like down to the coin. The only thing that they changed, they changed what the coin did. Because in the movie, I think the coin makes them uh, be able to. Yeah, undead to human. Yeah, right. But like in in your story, it brought back his mortal enemy. But yes, the the pirate even looks like the pirate from from the second movie. All of it was, and his crew are all deep ones. I mean, they're all. Look, it, that was my Lovecraft, the tip of my hat to Lovecraft, and and it was also my attempt to prove yes, I can actually write John Constantine if you give me a goddamn chance. <laughs> <laughs> But right. they wouldn't. They, I, I kept saying, look, I want to write Constantine, and they wouldn't let me because I wasn't English. Really? I wasn't British. Ugh, they should have let you write it. Well, no, you did a fantastic job with him, so 
But yeah, this is great because I know you should feel because oh, I feel so vindicated now. That Nancy, I know. you gotta understand. Me and John had this in-depth discussion last night about this, and this is like the shooter on the grassy knoll. He wanted to hear it from you that this was obviously a, a knockoff ripoff by Disney to, that stole your story. Even the the octopus coming out of dark Conrad's chest. He's like, this is this is theft, man. They owe you royalties. We gotta get some back. Some back pay for you. Yeah, yeah. You need residuals or, or something for this, Nancy. I would well, have some well, follow up on I, this. Well, that's the thing. It was work for hire. Ah. Uh, you know, if the two great ones in the form of Disney and Warner Brothers made locked horns, I did not see it. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like those things where you see the great the great gods fight one another, and and occasionally we feel earth earthquakes and and thunderstorms are the only evidence of this. You know, I let them know about it, and that's the last I ever heard. So yeah. I don't know what happened. And for all I know, Disney made some kind of tete-a-tete, you know, yeah. but that's all I know. Right, right. <laughs> they had a parlay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, they had a parlay. You know, speaking about them not letting you write, you said Constantine because you weren't British. Your dialogue, you were very heavy on the Creole Cajun accents the way you wrote. And to me, it was fascinating yeah. being a guy from Massachusetts where in normally, you know, you read something, you hear the voices in your own brain. And the way you wrote it made me think of the accents, made me, you know, explore that in my – in the way I was taking in the storytelling. And that was a fantastic uh, angle that you used to really bring me into the story. Well, that was one of my selling points. The thing is when, when Stuart – like I said, I didn't really quite finish the, the story about how I got the gig, but – but uh-huh. Stewart was working, and and when they when they decided they they needed to bring someone in with a background in horror to to revitalize the character, and they and they had a sh- they had a short list, and I was on it. Craig Spector and John Skip were on there as well, and there were a couple of other authors at the time that were that were on the list, but I was the only one that that you know I I was told you know if you're interested send us an outline and and you know for the first. For the, you know, a fairly detailed outline for the first year, and and a, an idea where we want to go for the second. Uh-huh. And I said, okay, and and basically I utilized it to do. And this was back when it was all like one and dones, and 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 continuing story arcs were not as you know there was no such thing as writing for the trades. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So most of mine were two or three story arcs, or had. Um, Subplots that would lead on into another two or three story arc, and introduce main character, you know, some some new characters, and wrote out some others. But I relied very heavily on the fact that I actually lived in New Orleans, and I actually know Cajuns, <laughs> and I actually right. I, 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 one of my friends at the time was a voodoo priestess, so I I actually utilized my you know sold that as my strength, and. Um, of course, after the first year, I ended up moving to New York. <laughs> oh, really? But I was, but I was still writing. You know, uh, you know, I still had ten years of living in New Orleans and, and Louisiana uh, to fall back on. Yeah, the dialogue definitely helped. Uh, you know, take me to the swamp, take me to the bio, a place I'd never been. But seeing the accents written in the dialogue was fantastic. I, I later dialed back on the on the um, the phonetic pronunciation because a couple of people who were Cajun got insulted yeah. <laughs> by that. So. Aspects of, of yours would and really actually, hold up. Uh, not to interrupt you guys, but you were talking about the creations that, you, you know, when you had to write your synopsis of what you're going to do with the run, you created a character of such significance in Lady Jane. I'm curious as far as what was the inspiration behind her? I've been told she was destroyed. So, well, before we even get to all that, because that's utter nonsense. I mean, it's terrible that, like you said, the, these things have been written out of continuity and what have you. What was the inspiration behind her? Where did she come from? What was your your motivation? Uh, Lady Jane is. There were two elements that comprised Lady Jane for the most part. There's there's the, the physical. The, her physical appearance is very much. Uh, I was a lot to Carolyn Jones from uh, as Morticia Adams and the Adams family, obviously. The, the, the idea uh, behind Lady Jane uh, it was in part um, kind of a, a tribute to you know Victorian novels of the, you know like uh, of George Sands and you know D. H. Lawrence, you know, Victorian Edwardian era of of stories about you know, that had strong female protagonists who were suffering under being 
second class citizens and kind of like proto feminist novels, you know, anything from like Madame Bovary to The Dollhouse, uh, you know, and stuff like Ibsen. Um, very much of that, of that era. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, or, J- or Jane Eyre, for that matter, where you had female characters who were having to struggle against, you know, falling, you know, um, falling in class, which was a huge thing in Victorian novels. You're making a bad marriage where your husband, you know, because women back then were considered infants, legally infants. Um, uh, they had no power. Uh, everything they owned could, it was the minute they were married was became their husbands. Right. And um, they had no, and that all changed when Queen Victoria came into power, you know, to, to a great extent, but it took a while. And, and, and she, in this case, you know, we have a woman who's, who inherited money and married a, a man who was an idiot and right, managed yeah. to lose, lose it all. And then, and then gasped, they ended up going from being, you know, upper middle class to middle class and, Ga- even gasped even more, became working class. And of course, he had no ability to be working class and got himself killed almost immediately working in, yeah. in, in a factory. Yeah. <laughs> got himself melted, yeah. Yeah, very similar. I think that there's a similar situation in the Magnificent, Magnificent Ambersons where, uh, uh, and that's also, it's also a, a reference to the Magnificent Ambersons where the guy goes from being, you know, the, a, a mega rich, Sob to working in a dynamite factory. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> and ends up get, ends up getting himself killed. <laughs> well, there you go. You know, he fell victim to alcoholism and yeah, it becomes an alcoholic and all that. Fa- you know, failing his family and his children, blah blah blah. And, and and she has to take up all the slack. But she's also modeled on a distant relative of mine uh, on my grandmother's side, my mother's mother's side, who. In the early 1900s, late 18, you know, about like late 1890s, early 1900s, probably, probably, well, probably even maybe the 1870s, because I keep I keep remembering that my grandmother was telling me this story. My grandmother was born in 1910, <laughs> <laughs> so 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 for her to have been a distant relative to that, that means she had to, you know, this had this had to have happened like in in the during the Industrial Revolution era. But she she herself had uh, had become widowed and had to work in in uh, some textile mill, and so her children uh, and, and 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 this is what happened quite a bit back then is like all the women would gather up their children and the older children would look after the younger ones and they'd all be in the same house you know and kind of like a crash or whatever, and at that time they were at my grand my at this this relative's house. And she was coming home from work, and as she's coming home from work, she happens to see that her house is on fire with all her children in it. And she goes running up to the uh, running in to try and save them, and she grabs the front doorknob. The the doorknob burns itself into her hand. Oh wow! And actually, and, and it actually branded itself. It was one of those with the you know the raised embossment. And right. she managed to, a couple of her children died, but she managed to get most of them out. Oh. And, um, but she went through the rest of her life with the, these brands on her hands. And she wore lace gloves, you know, or lace and velvet gloves to, to cover the, the scarring on her palms. So that, that, that's a bit of family history that got worked into that. It worked into Lady Jane, yeah, because, you know, for me, <clears throat> Lady Jane was such a fantastic character. And no matter what DC ever decides to do with stories or whatnot, the story still exists for me. She's still a very important character in Swamp Thing lore for me personally. No, no matter how they write it now or, or what have you, to me, that was a, a really significant contribution in your run. Well, I, I realized there wasn't a female. There was not a female member of parliament, right? And no. so that was <laughs> that was my my contribution was to create a female elemental because most of the others had been male, and, and in fact, all of them had been male as far as I could tell. And so I, you know, and since plants are both male and female, and she was also kind of a way uh, a way of kind of like a, a, a echo of what of what Abby was supposed to have become. Because at the, at this time it was not commonly known amongst the fans, but Alan Alan's original plans for Abby were that she was to end up being set on fire and jumping in the 
in the swamp and emerging as Swamp Thing had. I'm, I'm surprised y'all hadn't heard this. Yeah, no, <laughs> me neither. You're, you're, no. Yeah, this is news to me. <laughs> yeah, this, this that was that was the original that was the original plan and the original way to end Swamp Thing when Alan was was working on it, mm-hmm. but it, that did not happen. Wow. So Lady Jane was kind of like my take on that. Um, but at that time, yeah, yeah, that, that's what Alan had told me. Was that originally they were they were that was they were no plan for Abby. Mm-hmm. And and he actually congratulated me on having her leave him because she said, you know, no woman in her right mind with a spade do all this crap. Oh, good, good <laughs> lord! I know. And 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 that is that is very very true. And I actually have questions about that. I want to ask, but before I get into that, I do have a little bit of a question. So back during this t- this time period. You know, it, it seemed to me, especially going back and, and reading this run, I mean, you had so much what was considered controversial material in the run. And you just, even though it was a Vertigo book, you guys, you just don't see that much anymore, even in the Vertigo books today. I mean, you had uh, racism, the use of, uh, you know, the N-word, you had... Uh, people calling homosexuals queer and lighting crosses and all that. Do you think that there's like a reason that um, they've kind of shied away from that in some of the more recent Vertigo and adult mature books? Because you you really don't see the bravery of of telling stories like that in modern stories anymore. Yeah, I I'm, I'll admit that I have not really been following comics for the last probably since 2000. I'm, I'm not terribly sure what the changes are. I do know there's a lot more inclusion in terms of, you know, you're seeing more. Everything is so PC now, Nancy. Everything. Even in Vertigo, you got a few stories like Saga, which are a little bit more adult-oriented, but everything is so PC and politically correct now. Well, I hate to tell you, but I was accused of being PC and politically correct with my Swamp Thing run because I brought up these... Really? Yes, get get understand, uh, for a lot of people, bringing up the fact that racism exists, bringing up the fact that sexism exists, bringing up the fact that misogyny exists, bringing up the fact that environmental pollution exists, uh, that was considered that, that was considered PC politically correct because you're bringing up the subject matter that people don't want to discuss because it makes them uncomfortable, and that's actually in my you know, so I was accused of being quote unquote politically correct, and in my uh, and, whereas now they just deny everything and ignore the situations. <laughs> well, in in my mind, it being considered. Being called politically correct is not a bad thing, right? It means you're you're asking questions of power, right? You're you're asking the person why you know this exists, why does it exist? You know, I mean, this is my this is this is what happens when you're raised reading Dr. Seuss. So <laughs> like, why is this? You know, why is this consi- Why is this considered the? Why don't people talk about what's wrong? So yeah, I have uh, homophobia, I have gay bashing, people being murdered because they're black, because they're women, because they're they're gay. In 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 that run and swamp thing, I have political corruption, you know, religious intolerance, and in, you know any number of things going on there. And, and and when I first started writing something, it was not a Vertigo book. It it, it what I was writing led to you know, but I was I was doing my run at the same time swamp. Uh, Neil Gaiman was doing his first couple of years on on Sandman, and what we were doing, and what Peter Milligan was doing with Shade Changing Man, and and, um, and with Doom Patrol, and Grant Morrison with Doom Patrol, right. we basically led the way for Vertigo to be created as a way of separating these stories. And this is back when, in my mind, mature subject matter is asking serious questions. And 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 bringing the real world into the comic storyline, as opposed to just kind of the the alt the extreme of grim and gritty, but which is what you know the, the extremism of, of of Frank Miller, and and that type, which is just taking overblown, unrealistic violence and sexual situations, and as opposed to take, dealing with it in a, in a more realistic, mature 
you know, as, as it would happen in the real world, as opposed to you know, here's the shocking stuff, extreme stuff, and because it's so extreme, is no more real than some guy flying through the air. Right. It was a lot more realistic content. And actually, there's a, there's a point in your run when you did the um, Swamp Thing running for governor in Louisiana that I almost think you opened up a wormhole in time. Because yes, I did. Because I, I flipped through it today, and there's actually a line where the, the David, Ben Barron, who was at the time a parallel for David Duke, uh-huh, right. was running for governor, who ended up becoming, you know, like the, the Republican candidate for governor yeah. in Louisiana. He where he's talking about making America great again. Nancy, let me ask you a question about um, the situation you were going into with with uh, your home life at the time. I, w- I won't dig into that, but in regards to the the story when Swamp when when Abby left Swamp Thing uh, at the end, and she basically left she went out she she was trying to make her own way and then she she moved on and then she basically kind of uh tefe she she kind of basically rejected her as well too were you it it just seemed like it was a little fast that she moved on so quick was that more you writing about the human condition and about us as individuals, how we, we cope with things, or was that more to show that, you know, Abby had been through so much, she was just flawed that she would give up her own child and, and move off with this new guy, Don, just immediately after this? Yeah, uh, Don Tien Renard. The, um, the, the thing is, with, with you got to understand, I was only contracted for two years, and they, they, and I don't think they wanted me on. I can't remember. Say I was being offered Animal Man and Swamp Thing for a third year, but but at the same time I had a, a creator-owned character that I was that was being developed, and 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 I made the mistake of instead of like going on for another third year with Swamp Thing, I decided I wanted to go ahead and do the creator-owned thing. Uh, which was which ended up never coming uh, coming about. Even though they, I, I wrote two or three scripts and we did a lot of preliminary artwork and stuff like that. It ended up being throttled in the cradle. A series called Wick, uh, about a, a, a kind of like a, f- a female witch, uh, witch for hire, living in New York City. And um, and at the same time, I was, I had been approached by Glenn Danzig to do Sunglasses After Dark as a comic book series. So basically, I had these two kind of creator own things. So I opted not to continue into Swamp Thing, but, but towards the end of but one thing that DC told me they wanted me to do with my second year is that by the end of the second year, they wanted Swamp Thing to not be married and not have a kid. Okay. They wanted to clear they wanted him to be cleared off so that he had no children you know, no responsibilities whatsoever. I know it kinda of sounds familiar. So a little bit more of an editorial decision to kind of have the single it was, editorial, it was an editorial decision, and they told me that I could do whatever I wanted with them to get rid of them, but just get rid of them. Oh, wow. And they said, <laughs> and they didn't have any problems with killing either one of them. Wow. And I was actually kind of shocked when they said that because, you know, we're talking like, I've been, you know, we're talking like a two-year-old child. And, you know, and, and of course, Abby's been dead before, <laughs> but at that point had been dead before. But then again, I didn't want to be in the position of doing what Alan had done already. And I said, well, you want him by himself? You want to see what happens? Death means nothing in comics. It can be written away. It can be written away. Divorce in comics lasts forever. No one has ever been able to redo it. <laughs> Yeah. Once you break a marriage, uh, except maybe the Fantastic Four, and even then, some would say that did not work. Once you break up a marriage in comics, it's gone. Yeah, it's gone <laughs> because people are not willing to suspend that disbelief. They can. We don't know what happens when you die, but we know you never get back with your ex. <laughs> true, <laughs> true, true. <laughs> Very true. Trust me, if you've seen some of my exes, you would know why. <laughs> So basically, I I said, okay, you want this is what you want me to do with him. Well, you, you want him to be by himself. Well, I'll show you what happens when he's by himself. And I basically did a ten, Pete Townsend windmill 
with that character and just smashed him on the stage and said, okay, see what you can do. And anyone that's coming after me, see what you can do. Because this is how they want him. You, okay. And people hated me for it. Really? People hated me for that. And that people still don't forgive me for breaking them up. I, I wouldn't say it, it's hate on my end, but so much as it was so gut-wrenching because, you know, uh, and I'm, I'm still to this belief, you know, that uh, Linda, you know, Linda can be written away. They were married. Nobody cares about she Linda. Had, well, she was a woman in a refrigerator. She had to be killed for the story to start. Right, absolutely. But, but Abby... Abby is like always going to be his one true love. No matter where you go with the character, his heart is always going to belong to Abby. So it was just so gut wrenching, and that's one of the things at the at the end of your run. Um, it's basically he no longer has his daughter, he no longer has his wife. His friends are either all gone or he doesn't have his lover. Doesn't have his lover. His lover's gone. He's just back by himself square one and that and he did it to himself but like you said that was like a you smashing the guitar on the stage you know that's proof enough that he was still a man because he did it to himself yeah um by thinking oh yeah well she's not gonna mind i'll i'll do this and it was basically um taking her for granted for one thing yeah, and i have to time. and and frankly i think this is, I wrote it from a kind of a woman's perspective, which is, would any woman in her right mind put up with any of this bullshit? I have to ask you about something, though, real quick, because kind of backtracking a little bit about how editorial told you, okay, you get a Nix Abbey, Nix Tefe. This is kind of like the elephant in the room, okay? I want to talk about the 90s extreme swamp thing. Where... Was that something that was like dis- – how was that discussed? Like we need to – and I call it the 90s extreme because it seems like every character at the time needed spikes, needed a mullet. Yeah, I got to have a mullet. Um, you know, he's going to have this cool new like, you know, ni- early 90s style to him. Was that something you like – was that part of your decision? Was that editorial saying, hey, you know, we got to – That was that was completely my, my decision. Part really? of it was a little bit of, uh, of my – um, making fun of, of that. Uh, plus, okay. I, I, plus, I just wanted to. I, I just want. I said, you know, he's pretty much looked exact same for mm. years. <laughs> and the, the original idea, well, the idea for his hair, which the dreads, came from uh, at the time I was living in New York City, in the, on the Lower East Side, and uh, there was a grocery store. That I went to all the time called the Key Foods, and to my knowledge, is still there on Avenue A. And a couple of times when I was in store in the store, standing in the line, I found myself standing behind uh, Lenny Kravitz, who at the time had um, dreads, and he was actually one of the most physically beautiful men I've ever seen. So he is loosely based on Lenny Kravitz. Yeah, yeah, that would be nice, and, and you know, just put some hair on, you know. Because and and there's a there's a Steve Bissett drew a little uh, sketch for me back in '92, which now is probably floating around the internet. You know, we were talking about about what Swamp, you know, Swamp Thing as a as a character. And I said, you, you know, so the the idea is that when uh, according to to Alan, when he was you know, Holland's memories of being a man, of being alive, to to form this. Mm-hmm. To form him, and and he's got ears. He's got fingernails. Right. He's got he's got a weightlifter's ass on him, but there's no dick. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, right. I mean, and he's got toenails. There's no man I know who <laughs> can constitute himself without a dick. And not only that, it would probably be at least twenty five percent bigger. <laughs> yeah, of course, you can manifest right. your own. Right. They would overcompensate. Yeah, I, I, I <laughs> would be overcompensating. And I said, feel the power of yeah, the dirt. Yeah, the, the dirt yeah, digger. Yeah. I said, he, there's no way on. There's no way he would come back without root and yams. And, <laughs> right. and he said, "You're you're absolutely correct." And he <laughs> and he proceeded to draw the sketch of swap thing complete with root and yams for me. Oh, wow. and uh, 
Yeah, it took him less than five minutes, and you know, I, I treasure it. <laughs> and, As would anybody, uh, of course. And, and we decided that probably, like most things in nature, once he's used it, it just falls off. Uh, I'm sorry. I was going to say before I brought up the whole mullet or the early 90s uh, dreadlock thing, you were going to talk a little bit about Connie Sun- Sunderland. And um, – I was a little curious about that because there's one thing, me as a reader, and this is just my humble opinion, is that Alan Moore is always considered the gold standard of, of the Swamp Thing, and you know, rightfully so. But he was kind of weak in his characterizations of women at times. Um, I think there was a part or a part of his run after uh, Gotham City where Swamp Thing was annihilated, where you actually, for the first time, you saw Abby as a strong character, um, for me personally, as a reader. And I think your run, of course, being from a woman's perspective, you really built up these women characters, Lady Jane, Abby, uh, again, Connie, as being uh, really significant and powerful and important parts of your run. Where did the inspiration for Connie come from? Well, Connie was, um, we wanted to bring back General Sutherland. Right. But there's no way he could really do that because he was actually dead. (laughs) Well, the few characters was well and truly dead. Um, although we do know his soul uh, is burning in hell. The Sunderland Corporation itself, I, I thought, well, if we can't bring back, really bring back the, the general, the general still lives through his corporations, but who would be in charge of that corporation? And I ended up deciding it would be, uh, somehow ended up with, with Connie. And Connie is based very uh, on a couple of, Characters, uh, one of which is Angela Lansbury's character from Manchuria, Canada, uh, where, where you know basically a, a very much a, an iron an iron maiden. But I combined her with um, there's uh, one of the, one of my friend groups that uh, I was involved in was um, prior to becoming a, a professional writer was the Church of the Subgenius. Mm-hmm. Uh, a uh, I don't know if if Anyone listening to this is familiar with the Church of the Sub Genius, but it was kind of like a uh, guerrilla comedy slash alternate culture slash underground arts uh, collective who created a religion, a fake religion, and basically social, social satire through a fake religion based on a character named J.R. Bob Dobbs, mm-hmm. uh, a, a grinning, pipe smoking, glad hander who is, you know, kind of like a combination of, of you know L. Ron Hubbard and um uh Andy Griffith's character from A Face of the Crowd, you know, Elmer Gantry and all that. Kind of like um but it was basically social satire. It, it got its start in the late seventies, early eighties and is still still continuing today, but a lot of it involved basically every conspiracy theory you've ever heard jammed into one rather unwieldy uh religious Doctrine that inclu- that inc- uh, includes everything from the JFK assassinations to wow. Yetis to the U- to UFOs, Men in Black, everything everything in between, kind of like a kind of a parody of Scientology. Bob's wife, the power behind the throne, is is Connie Dobbs, and that's where Connie's name comes from. And wow. into a part, she, it, it, what you're seeing is Connie Sunderland is in part. Uh, uh, based on the, the interpretation of Connie Dobbs. I originally created her as kind of like, like, like Mr. Burns in a brazier. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, yeah, yeah. And Mr. Burns in bra and panties, and for all I know, he's been seen in them. But um, <laughs> uh, kind of like going, starting at that extreme, but as I, as I worked on the character more and more I, and developed her more, she became... I wouldn't say I wouldn't say I sympathized with her exactly, but I could understand where she was coming from a lot better. She was the only thing from my run that ever popped up in another uh, Vertigo comic. And that was the uh, Unmen book, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I didn't know about that until, until years after the fact. That allowed me to, to bring back both Sunderland and Arcane and incorporate them into the same character. Because everyone, because I was getting, when's Arcane going to come back? What are you going to bring back that General Sutherland? And I thought, well, you know, 
Just to kind of close up on your Swamp Thing run a little bit here, you know, you, you'd mentioned that you would sign the contract for two years. Is that a close? You went to go do some independent work. Were there any concepts or any things that you really want? Like, for example, in the Parliament of Trees Facebook group, you mentioned there was another uh, Lady Jane story you wanted to tell, um, but it never m- materialized at DC. Was there anything that you really wanted to do or with the character that just didn't yeah, come about? Yeah, I had about? A, an idea for something for a series or a miniseries, whatever they uh, called Arcane Blood. And mm. and I, in one of the uh, comics, I'll have to go back and look, because I've gotten to the point where I can't remember what I, if what I wrote that, uh, what between what I wrote and got published and what I wrote and got and right. got cut right now. So I have to go back and look. But uh, there's one point I was going to have, um, if, if it didn't pop up somewhere where, you know, the Phantom Stranger is... Uh, it, and I think it may have, have been a line that got cut by editorial where Swamp Thing or Phantom Stranger is introduced to Tefe for the first time, you know, and, and, and then he realizes, and he says, well, where did this child come from? She says, well, it's mine and, and Alex. He says, well, that's not possible. He says, well, we used a, a, uh, sperm donor. And it's, you know, yeah, uh, right. father, <laughs> quite way of saying it. And, and well, who was the father? Just John Constantine, and and Phantom Strangers has a, a genuinely startled look on his face and goes, "Cross to Constantine with an arcane." That that is true. That would be a absolutely powerful yet horrible person <laughs> potentially. Basically, the uh, the idea was that uh, Abby, uh, well, it, 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 with arcane blood, is that. Tefe, as she gets older, has to, you know, she's being raised in the parliament and, um, and by the parliament, uh, and, and particularly by Lady Jane. And Lady Jane, as we discover, has had a child by Swamp Thing, you know, through, parthen- through parthenogesis or whatever you want to call it, you know, because you know, that's what happens with plants when you cross. So them. Tefe has a brother or sister? Yeah, Man, yeah, that yeah well, be Tefe has a half brother, um, uh, called, uh, who's called the Page. Um, he is the page of Parliament, and um, uh, and looks exactly like Swamp Thing. You know, in fact, looks exactly like the old, the original Swamp Thing. And as Tefe gets older, her human and tele- elemental parts fight with one another, and the arcane blood makes itself known. Wow. Uh, and she starts becoming; she's tempted to become evil. The Parliament decides she has to. You know, there, there has to be some way of separating the human from the from the element. Amazing. Because otherwise, you're going to end up with an elemental that will destroy the world. Right. And uh, involved, if I remember correctly, the, the proposal involved Phantom Stranger, uh, Zaytana, you know, several of the occult, Dr. Fate, several of the occult. God, I want to read this right now. <laughs> I really, I want to read this right this minute. And, 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 and Constantine obviously was also involved. And where Tefe has to and eventually, and they do end up the, the elemental part of her, the part that was the sprout, is separated from her and is placed inside the page. And and so the new elemental, the one that will replace Swamp Thing, is basically his son, his son and his daughter. This is amazing, boss. And uh, and not only that, but the page ends up with Abby. What? What? Wait! What? <laughs> Mind blown. What? So, so basically, it, it would draw Abby. It was the idea was it would draw Abby and Swamp Thing back to try and save their daughter, and Swamp Thing dies, but is re- resurrected to being the new elemental, yeah, you know, being the page, you know, kind of going almost a reset button. Well, that uh, that sounds absolutely amazing. I know. Nancy. I want. I, I've got to read this. I want to read this. I want to pay yeah, for this. I, th- I think you need to contact somebody and say, uh, hey, guys, we need to kind of do this story now. Now's the time. To be honest, I haven't really kept up with with the New 52 or any of that. All I know is all, everything okay. I ever worked on is out of continuity. Not in my mind. Yeah, not to me, not to this reader. You're the woman to do it. <laughs> you can bring it all back. Well, Nancy, I think we're going to go ahead and... We're going to wrap up. We absolutely, positively have enjoyed talking with you, and we want to bring yeah, you absolutely. back. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. If if you would like to come back sometime. Oh, no problem. No problem. 
I am. I, I do have other thing. I, I do. I'm still writing comics. I mean, I'm Abs- absolutely, and and that's why I was going to ask. What would you like to promote? Well, right now, I'm. I've got uh, uh, Army of Darkness. Furious Road is being uh, released. Still being published by Dynamite. I, uh, issue five comes out on, I believe, July thirteenth, and um, it's a it's a six issue miniseries. The, the final issue comes out in August. And it's basically uh, a post-apocalyptic version of uh, it. Kind of combines Evil Dead, Army of Darkness, uh, you know, the Evil Dead slash Army of Darkness universe one. with you know elements from uh, Mad Max, Fury Road, obviously, and and, um, and Walking Dead, um, you know, where it's a post-apocalyptic world, you know, set 20 years from now, wherever now is in the Evil Dead franchise, and where the deadites have managed to spread out and collapse our society, a la the, the Walking Dead, and um, it's up to Ash, uh, along with uh, um, having to team up with uh, the Frankenstein's monster, Dracula, and a werewolf biker gang, because the deadites don't play well with anybody, yeah. and, and uh, to, to, to try and save the world. And it's, got, it's my tribute to, to 1970s grindhouse and, and driving sure, culture. Sure. But it's an excellent series, and I recommend it to everybody out there to read it. Uh, thank you. I, and I've been very lucky. And have, I had a, an excellent artist in the form of uh, Cooper Ball, who's a Brazilian comics artist. And he and I talk on Facebook on a, uh, almost daily uh, through software, software tra- you know, translation software. And uh, you know, we've had a blast doing this. And um, I've also got, um, uh, like I said, I've got a, a few proposals out. I, I, I have a and uh, my my work is available to um, my prose work is available to Amazon, um, I, and I did Vampirella for two years for De- for Dynamite, and and those are now available in collect um, in uh, collected editions. Uh, Vampirella, uh, Our Lady of Shadows, and Vampirella: God Save the Queen. Excellent stuff. You know, and and, and my Sunglasses After Dark twentieth um, twentieth uh, anniversary year twenty fifth anniversary. Uh, collection. I, I guess it's the 20th anniversary because the, the, uh, my artist Stan Shaw and I uh, we released uh, Sunglasses After Dark through IDW in a collected mm-hmm. edition, and uh, it had originally been published by Glenn, uh, Glenn Danzig's uh, Erotic Publications, mm-hmm. uh, but we since we couldn't afford to buy the film back from Glenn, but we still own the artwork and the copyrights and all that. Stan and I decided to recolor the book and reletter it. Okay. Um, as we never liked the coloring on the on the original run, and it completely transformed the work. Yeah, that was excellent. What about this? Um, you said you were working on an anthology or, uh, with with Bissett or for Bissett. What was? Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm telling tales out of school, but certainly my my run during my tenure on Swamp Thing for something that he's publishing. Uh, I'm also going to be doing a Sky Solo uh, story for him. Some, you know, some of he's finally got the rights to the characters that he created for 1963. Got the rights to his Fury and Sky Solo characters back. And we do we got to have you back on sometime soon because I do have a whole page full of more questions for you. But of course, time restraints being what they are, they might have to wait for another day. But yeah, my swamp, I had forgotten just how dense my swamp thing was. <laughs> it was amazing. Well, and it's all available through Comixology now. I don't know if they'll ever, ever release my run in physical format. Well, again, we appreciate you being on so much, and um, it was fantastic, and we can't well, thank you well, enough. Well, thanks for having me. I, I, I really appreciate it, and I'm glad people are still interested in talking to me about this. Always. Something years after I, I signed off, glad. I, I enjoyed Swamp I enjoyed Swamp Thing, writing Swamp Thing. It was some of, some of the best years of my career, some of the best work, I think, in my career. And in case if you ever want to know what he sounds like in my head, it's mm-hmm. Lance Hendrickson. Okay. That's his voice. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much, Nancy. You're welcome. Mm-hmm. 